these instruments. So uh, now I've got to now I've got to do the worship kind of stuff, and then of course Marty had a stroke, so I'm doing the, the secretary and treasure kind of stuff. So I mean, I just you know, on the mess right now. But anyway, we're having a great time, and uh, it's great to have them back uh, today. They're going to be moving down to a church called the Block Church. I don't know which block, but we're in a Block Church someplace. Uh, I mean, it's under square, you know. But uh, we're uh, we're having them here today to thank them for. 10 years, uh, well, actually more than 10 years of service here. Um, I don't know if you remember how they came here. It was the month of Jonathan's uh, heart attack, and Lois and I flew out to Ohio, and I needed somebody to come here and preach for me that week, and uh, I'd actually been trying to get Pastor Scott at least to come for a number of months before that, and kind of just things were working out. I said, hey, I really need somebody to preach. He came and preached, and then uh, I think he came back a second or third time because we were gone a full month, and then he said, is there anything I could do to help? I said, well, I really need a worship leader. And um, he came uh, on uh, staff and uh, was really a help during one of my deployments. He carried us uh, through the kind of that with the rest of the elders. And so really appreciated that. And uh, I don't know how many of you know, um, I knew him back when he was like seven or eight years old. And I was 17 or 18. I've got about 10 years. I know he looks like he's 10 years older than me, but really I'm 10 years older than him. <laughs> oh, uh, wow. But uh, I was... I was leading, uh, you know, I was leading the, um, I was his dad's worship leader at his dad's church back at Emmanuel Baptist in Maple Shade, New Jersey. So I was the choir director, and I, I don't know if he remembers from that time, I, he probably wouldn't even care about worship or choirs back then, but uh, at any rate, that was a long time ago. And so uh, it kind of turned around, and he came here, and so we really appreciate him being here for 10 years, and uh, I am very unhappy about you folks leaving, you know that, but uh, what can I say? I tried to get him to stay, get a membership, and nothing I said would work, so I don't have very much influence over them, but... Uh, it's good to, good to have them. We, did, um, we have a plaque here that I'd like to um, present to them, and uh, we'll put it on the piano so you folks can see it. I didn't put, leave it out first service because I didn't want you to folks to see it beforehand, but um, it's, a, it's a plaque, and they, they sold it the first service, so um, there it is again. Beautiful. Okay, And uh, I'll put it out so you folks can see it later on. It says, thank you. It's a, it's a crystal it says, thank you for serving our worship and as our worship and co-teaching pastor and wife team presented to Pastor Scott and Lisa Mitchell from September 2006 to November 2017. Thank you for your dedication and commitment to the congregation of the First Baptist Church. Your incredible talent, versatility, and dedication has impacted both our worship and our teaching ministry during the decade plus which you were both invested with us here. Thank you for sharing your music, leadership, and commitment to the work. And so I'll take that and put it out. I, I don't want to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it out of the box and I'll, I'll put it on there. I didn't want to take it out first service because I took it out to look at it and it took me an hour and a half to get all my fingerprints off of it <laughs> this last week. So I'll put that out. We also, I don't know if you know, um, and I'm hoping nobody let the cat out of the bag. But we did take a the we designated the Easter offering this year towards your ministry. Oh my God! And uh, I don't uh, so so somebody did keep at least one secret from you. I, I, we try to keep a, sample, a couple things. So this is your honorarium check, which is going to be there for <laughs> preaching today. But the uh, Easter offering came out to fourteen hundred and three dollars and sixty cents. Oh my gosh! Thousand four hundred dollars. Over thousand four hundred dollars. So so it's a, that's that one's made out to Marriage Rocks, and that goes toward their ministry. And uh, if you remember. Um, been here a while. We uh, try to give our Thanksgiving offering to our, our, Christmas, our missionaries' Christmas gifts. Our Christmas offering goes towards some project that we want to see completed here at the church or whatever. And our Easter offering all these goes to a local ministry which is working in the area. And so you are a local ministry. This. Uh, uh, <laughs> I got that one right, man. <laughs> I ought to get kudos on that one, right? God bless you both. Thank you, Pastor Gary. We'll take the mic for Lisa. All right, how are we doing, First Baptist? All right, we are so excited to be back with you. And despite all the guilt trips and the ribbing, you know, we did last 10 years, right? And uh, actually, we were thrilled to be able to minister here for 10 years. Uh, God brought us here, as, as, uh, as it says in the Old Testament, for such a time as this, right? And uh, we had taken on uh, caring for our parents in our home, and uh, you know, there's just so many things that were just so right about us being here in Morrisville, ministering with you uh, during that season of our lives and ministry, and we cherish those years. But God also had planted seeds in our hearts about marriage ministry even before we came here, and those seeds kept developing while we were here. 
And uh, we were so excited um, in 2017 to be able to launch Marriage Rocks Incorporated, which is a nonprofit ministry that we uh, have started. And you would not believe the doors God has continued to open up to us. We'll share a little bit about some of that in just a minute. So today's message, in case you weren't sure, is going to be on marriage. <laughs> All right? And um, some of you who, are, who aren't married, you know, want to maybe turn off your, your, your ears. But don't do that because every one of you knows somebody in your life who you care about who's married. There are marriages that you are praying for, marriages that you see struggling uh, some of you are single and, and want to be married. In fact, let me just ask you, how many of you are married in here today? All right. How many are single today, not married today? How many of you wish you weren't married today? No, no, no don't, don't answer that question. You'll have a long ride home. But for those of you who are married, know that marriage is a journey, isn't it? It is. Of all kinds of ups and downs and twists and turns and hairpin turns and cliffhangers and for Scott and I, we've experienced all the above in uh, our journey, which started August 20th, 1988. So we will be married 30 years 30 in years. two months. <laughs> and so early in our marriage, at three years into our marriage, is probably the biggest bump in the road. It wouldn't, wouldn't even call it a bump. It was a cliffhanger uh, with the birth of our first daughter. So I'm going to introduce you to our family. Um, our first daughter, Lindsay, was born one pound, 13 ounces, two, uh, two months early, and she had a chromosome abnormality called ring 13. So she's 26, but she, uh, soon to be 27, but she is really like a two-year-old. Um, she is at home with us full time. We have an in-home service that God provided um, for her. So we have aides that come in the house, take her out, uh, feed her, and do all that kind of stuff so that I can work and do what I do, our ministry and all of that kind of thing. And it's pretty awesome. Um, she has literally been our greatest teacher, our greatest influence, and she has been very grounding for us. So, um, and she's just developed character in us and in our kids that you cannot put a price on. Um, so our other kids, our second child was Ashley Mitchell, and she is in Minnesota. Although it's pretty hot there right now. <laughs> Um, they get a lot of snow, and it goes 30 below, and um, she loves it, and so she is uh, out there uh, full-time, and our third child was Josiah. He is going to be 22. They're all summer birthdays, so they're all about ready to change to the next age, and he is, his new journey, I know some of you, we announced that he was going into the Navy. That's when he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life, and since then, God has made it very clear he has a passion for, he's going to be a barber. And so he started that he, career. He, I, he started working on me. It did not, <laughs> did not take long. <laughs> and uh, some of you may have heard that he broke his arm really badly last week. He had a compound fracture. One was open, came through the skin, and had emergency surgery last Thursday night. And so uh, he is doing amazing. I am happy to report. He actually, I told him, I'll have you hook cutting as soon as you can. Some of you know I do essential oils, and so um, he cut six people on Friday in our home. Of course, I had his arm wrapped and everything, but he has zero pain. He's doing amazing um, recovery from that. So for some of you who've heard that story. Ten years into our marriage, our journey changed significantly as we took in our parents. Um, and a lot of you know our parents because that was our season here, which this church was so the perfect church for our parents. There was no better place for us to be to uh, care give for them while they were here. They loved it. They loved it here. And Scott's parents, we had his mom 14 years, his dad 17. And then uh, my mom, 2009, passed away of ovarian stage 4, nine, 19 days after she was diagnosed. And so then we brought my dad in. So we had three 80-year-olds for two and a half years. Some of you remember that. And um, then he... Uh, Scott's mom passed away in 2011, and then the, uh, we called them the boys, Scott's dad and my dad. Um, both passed away in 2016. Scott's dad had dementia, as some of you, you remember, and then my dad was diabetic and lost both legs one at a time. We went through a lot of surgeries with that, and you guys went through that with us. Mm -hmm. So we've been through a lot in our 30-year journey, and what we're going to share, some people always ask me, what's your secret? What's your secret? How, do you, how are you surviving this? But not only did we survive, we thrived because 
of the principles of God's word and because of our passion for marriage and because, so today we're going to start with a very foundation, four simple points, uh, solid rocks, and so um, Scott's going to share how our Marriage Rocks ministry, the birth of it, how it began. Yeah, I mean, we launched Marriage Rocks as an official ministry in 2017 at the beginning, but I mean, it again had been germinating before that. Um, I was a youth pastor, many of you knew that for 10 years, I was a senior pastor, an associate pastor here. Um, you know, God just opened up opportunities besides the fact of seeing a lot of our, our young people come back to us wanting to be married. We had to develop a premarital counseling ministry uh, to be able to prepare them for that. But then God opened up opportunities for us to actually uh, lead conferences and speak at retreats, uh, both men's retreats, women's retreats, and marriage conferences. The first one we actually got invited to, believe it or not, was Bermuda. Pastor Troy in Bermuda said, Scott, Lisa, I need you to pray about coming to Bermuda to do a marriage conference. I said, Troy, let us pray about it. Yes, we'll be there. <laughs> you know, suffering for Jesus in Bermuda, right? But, um, but since then, God has opened up all kinds of opportunities. Some of you uh, were with us, Carissa and Hal and uh, Orpha went with us to Bermuda, uh, not to Bermuda, to Sweden, very different place, with uh, Tony and Gwen and just had a little bit of an opportunity as part of the trip to do a marriage conference there. Uh, and then we've been in churches, camps, hotels. Uh, God has just continued to open up so many things. But how did marriage rock start? Actually, God gave the idea of rocks to Lisa. She was saying, you know, it all starts with what? A rock, right? A guy gets the girl a rock. And uh, then shortly into your marriage, you're throwing rocks at each other, right? <laughs> and your marriage can go on the rocks. But the idea, you know, in the modern vernacular is that your marriage is supposed to rock. That's a positive thing. It's rocking. But, um, you know, what, what really happened that solidified that rock theme was uh, about five years ago, we vacationed in New Hampshire for a week, just about every year, my family and, and our family. And uh, for the first time, I was able to climb the highest mountain east of the Mississippi River. It's found in the state of New Hampshire, and it's called Mount Washington. Uh, Mount Washington is over 6,000 feet. It's a, a long climb. It's a difficult climb. You start out, it could be 80 degrees at the bottom, 40 degrees at the top. That's how quickly things change. And you got to be prepared. And that entire rock, and there's a picture of me and my family at the top after a five and a half hour hike. The whole way up, the whole trail were, were rocks. And I found very quickly that the rocks I wanted to step on going up that mountain looked like this. They were smooth. They were flat. They were solid. They didn't move out from under my feet. They didn't trip me up. And I wanted to step right on there and then move up with the, my next step to the next solid rock. And my friends, in marriage, there are solid rocks, aren't there? There are, what are they? They're, they're, they're timeless biblical principles that God has set for, forth for us in his word that never change, that help us navigate to know how to do marriage the right way. And when we don't, we can get in all kinds of trouble. Today, we're going to talk about one of those solid rocks in, in depth. Another rock I wanted to stay away from, and I wanted to swear at at times, in Christian love, um, were these jagged rocks and they were all over the place too and I had to watch so that I didn't step on a jagged rock because the jagged rock would trip me up sprain my ankle or bruise the bottom of my feet are there jagged rocks in marriage are there things that can destroy you trip you up cause you to fall and hurt yourselves absolutely so many things we talk in our in our book that's coming out this summer we have three sections of our book solid rocks section one Jagged Rocks, section two, where we talk about things like addictions that will destroy marriages, lust and sexual unfaithfulness, and then some of the root issues like pride and selfishness will destroy your marriage if you're not careful. So those are some of the jagged rocks that you want to avoid at all costs. And then we also found that there were some of these along the way, these roundish type rocks. We call these rolling rocks. These in the third section of our book, Marriage Rocks, um, are the neutral areas that just about every marriage faces, right? Things like in-laws. When you got married, did you pick up a few people along the way too? You know, uh, uh, in-laws, you know, in, uh, father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, for better, for worse, right? And you don't want in-laws to become outlaws, and that will happen if you're not careful. So those are a rolling rock. And uh, finances, of course, is one of the biggest rolling rocks. Not right or wrong, but how you handle them in marriage is huge. It's the number one area of conflict and in some cases, divorce in marriages. Trials, we talked about that, and raising children. There's so many rolling rocks. Again, not right or wrong areas. It's just something you have to navigate together as a couple. So that's how marriage rocks developed. 
So our mission statement uh, for our Marriage Rocks ministry is to encourage, equip, and inspire couples to develop radically successful marriages and families. And what we have seen is uh, across the board, marriages hanging on by a thread. And not only do we want them to be successful, we want them to be radically successful, thriving instead of b barely surviving. So that is our goal and to, and we have experienced being able to thrive through everything that God has allowed us to go through. And it's because of what we're gonna share with you today, just the beginning, just a piece. <laughs> of our, our secret. People say, what is your secret? Well, we're going to share a little bit of our secret, which is not really a secret, but it's it's huge. Yeah, huge for us for sure. So why is marriage so important? Um, let me just reflect on a couple reasons why marriage is so important and why it's so important to God. Uh, the first reason is because it's actually the first human relationship that God created, right? We go back to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, he didn't create, you know, mother-daughter Father, son, you know, brother, sister, whatever. He created husband and wife. And I'd like to read that passage to you in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. It says, The Lord God said, It is not good. That's the first time God said anything in his creation wasn't good. And it wasn't like God said, Oops, I made a mistake. No. What wasn't good? It wasn't good that man was alone. Well, some of you wives know what that means, right? It's not good for my man to be alone with the kids. You know, it's not good for my man to be alone. You know, in the grocery store, it's not, no, well, it's not just talking about that, but it's not good for man to be alone. In other words, God created within man something that, well, there was an emptiness, there was a void, there was a need that he needed to fill. And so it says that I will make a helper suitable for him. Lisa's going to talk about that in just a second. But it says, the Lord God formed out of the ground all the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the, uh, uh, in the sky, and all the wild animals. And by the way, you know, Adam's probably noticing, there seems to be like two of each. And they're both a little different, right? It's male and female. And it says, but for Adam, once again, second time, no suitable helper was found. So God decided to perform surgery. Tell me if this doesn't sound like a surgery. The Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. That's anesthesia, right? And then, while he was sleeping, it says that he opened up and took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God, it says, made, and that, that English word does not do justice to the original language. That word made is the idea of created, fashioned, uh, a masterpiece, a masterpiece, a work of art. He, he created woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And here comes the first wedding in human history. And he, God the Father, did what? Brought her to the man. You know, and in most weddings that we do, there's a father uh, at the back of the church, you know, bringing his daughter to present to her new husband. And God the Father, it says, brought Eve down and presented her to Adam. And Adam said, this is now bone of my f bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Uh, last, last one to name was, was his wife. And that is why man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And the two become what? One flesh. And it says, And Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. My friends, marriage is important. We know because it's the first human relationship God created. There's something special about it. And, and many of you know that the Bible doesn't just start with a wedding. It also ends with a wedding. Did you know that? Revelation 19 talks about the wedding supper of the Lamb. It, it's, it's the wedding reception of Christ being wed to his bride, the church. And that's you and I, if you put your faith in Christ. That's one reception you do not want to miss. You don't want to talk about a party to beat all parties, a dancing to beat all dancing, if you dance. Um, but also, not only is it important because the Bible starts and ends, and marriage, by the way, is a theme throughout the Bible, but also it's a reflection of Christ, as I just mentioned, and his bride, the church. Every Christian marriage has the opportunity to bring God incredible glory and to be an incredible testimony of his love, his grace, his desire uh, for his, his people. And just think, too, why marriage is so important. Can you imagine if marriages were healthy in our society today? If marriages were healthy, the family would be stronger, right? And if families were stronger, communities would be stronger, right? 
And if communities are stronger, our schools, you know, and all the stuff we read about, the shootings and the violence and the bullying, that would, that would change dramatically if kids were growing up in a healthy family where mom and dad were together and loving each other. Do you believe that? Come on. And if you had healthier communities, healthier churches, healthier societies, healthier cities, healthier country, it would make all the difference in the world. And that's why we're so committed to marriage ministry, trying to revive marriages one couple at a time. And so today we want to talk about the power. The power of teamwork. So the power of teamwork is, is, our, is the title of our message. And so we're going to go with the team theme. And as you know, we won the Super Bowl. And um, so th there's so many parallels in the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. And we're going to kind of tell you a couple of those as we, as we go through the message today. But the first uh, point is we need to follow God. We need to follow God. So the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. So there we go with that rock theme. It starts with following God. That is a solid rock, um, and that was a solid rock for us. So if God created marriage, it makes sense to go to him to figure out how it's supposed to work, right? If your car breaks down, you don't take your car to a dentist, right? You take it to a mechanic. And so with marriage, if you want to know how it works and how it's supposed to work, go to the one who created it, who designed it, has the blueprint, and knows exactly how it's supposed to work. So we know that Adam and Eve were the first created couple, right? So how did they do at following God? Well, let's take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 3, because you know that at the end of chapter 2, after they were naked and everything was cool, the next verse didn't say, and they lived happily ever after. Because it's not a fable, it's not a fairy tale, it's not some kind of myth or story, it's an account. The next verse actually says in chapter 3, now the serpent, and now we're introduced to another personality in this huge drama. The serpent, who we know was more than just a snake, but, but and dwelt by the adversary, the devil, also named Satan, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had created. And he targets the woman and says to the woman, did God really say, and let me just share with you, his tactics have not changed much over the years. That Satan's way of getting us to fall is to get us to question God. And that's where he starts with Eve. Did God really say? And then he exaggerates kind of a portion of the truth. Did he, say, did he really say you can't eat of, of the, all the trees in the garden or from any tree in the garden? And the woman says to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat from the fruit in the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will what? You will die. And so what does the adversary, the devil, want to do next? Besides getting us to question God, he wants, us to, he wants to contradict God. He wants us to question God. Uh, you will certainly not die, Eve. The serpent says, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve, don't you realize God's holding out on you? Don't you realize that, that, that you could have so much more? So much more, knowing both good and evil. And don't you want to be like God? Isn't that a good thing? So verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, it says that she took some and she ate it. And all the married men in the room say, Boo, boo, <laughs> see that? It's all the woman's fault. It's all Eve's fault, right? But you know who God holds accountable for the fall of man? Adam. You know why? Because where was Adam when all this was taking place? The answer is right in the scripture. She took some and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband, who was where? With her. In the Hebrew, again, it means in close proximity. He was there, and he never stepped up to protect his wife. He never stepped up and said, Eve, don't do this thing. Don't disobey God. Instead, he took, he ate. It says the eyes of them were both open, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together to make coverings. And you know the next thing they did when they heard God coming? They hid. I do give them credit. At least they hid together. So that was at least something. But the fact is they knew they were in trouble. Now I got to tell you, we, we dressed in our Eagles outfits to illustrate the power of teamwork. One of the most important solid rocks that Lisa and I have 
discovered is so foundational for a healthy and successful and a radically successful marriage. And nothing seemed to illustrate teamwork better for us in this past year than the Eagles season, right? I mean, it was an amazing season. And, uh, you know, so much obviously went right, but there was a, a trust that the Eagles players had in their coaches, in the staff, the trainers, in the playbook, in the game plan. And when you trust God's word, God's principles, when you decide to follow God's plan for marriage, it works every time. And you will have an incredible success. Now, we want to show you a quick video clip of one of the heroes of, of, of the Super Bowl. And this interview with Zach Ertz, our tight end, actually took place before the Super Bowl. But the interviewer actually asked a question about his relationship with his wife and the key to their success. Don't, don't miss what he says. Ball Sunday this year, um, just a story about athletes talking about their faith in Christ. Yeah. How important is it for you to use your platform to glorify God? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. Um, our number one goal on this earth is to make disciples. Uh, that's the only job that we are pretty much, we want to do. Um, so faith in football this Sunday is huge. This is a platform that we have to draw people to the word, uh, to Jesus. Uh, it's something that we don't take for granted by any means. Uh, it's obviously responsibility, but we love that. Uh, we want to draw people to Christ. Um, the Football Sunday thing is going to be great for the world, hopefully. Uh, and yeah, it's fun. When did Jesus become real to you, especially Football Sunday? Yeah. Um, last, I, I, I mean, I always, had, I always knew Jesus. I always knew who he was. Uh, but I didn't have the relationship like I do now. Um, it was kind of last year, I was going through some things during the season. I would always be really high if, we, if I had a great game and really low if we lost and I had a bad game. Um, whereas I would see guys in the locker room like Carson, Trey Burton, Jordan Hicks, Jordan Matthews when he was on the team that would always remain even keeled. And I was pretty much envious of them. Uh, so they kind of continued to push me in ways to grow in my faith. Uh, I got baptized this past off season in California before my wedding. Uh, with our pastor that did the wedding. Um, so last March is when I ded truly dedicated my life, um, and it was the best thing that ever happened. You have the faith from the locker room and now at home with Jude Liam. Yeah. How are you able to, you both are able to grow together in Christ now? Yeah, I mean, being the head of the household, uh, the foundation of our marriage is built on the Word. Um, anytime you're able to build something with that strong foundation, you're not going to be easily swayed. Um, so that's kind of the thing that we strive for because the distance that we have to work through is extremely difficult. Uh, it could pull you in ways that is extremely tough or it's extremely strenuous on a relationship. Um, so being able to be rooted in the word and hold each other accountable to something much bigger than the two of us allows us to have an incredible marriage. Last one for me, this has been a crazy week all the way around, but how have you been able to be consistent in your faith during this wacky week? Yeah, Super I mean, I think the seeds were sown a long time ago. Um, I was able to prepare myself for this week because I've been in the Word throughout uh, the past year, um, growing in my faith, obviously having teammates to push me each and every day. Uh, it's a huge reason I'm able to be accountable to them, um, and they're able to be accountable to me too. Uh, we're never going to let each other slip, um, and that's why I love being on this team and being around those guys. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so hopefully you caught it. He says the foundation of our marriage is what? The Word. The Word. The Word. He kept going back to the Word is foundational, and that's our point. In order to follow God, you have to be in His playbook. You need to follow His blueprint and when scott and i were engaged we picked a life verse so our marriage life verse is here and i'm going to read it to you and i cannot describe to you or explain to you how foundational this verse was for us carrying us through the last 30 years so trust in the lord with some of your heart and lean not on uh, your uh, own uh, understanding uh, uh, you might you misread that just oh okay let me again. try again sorry Tr to interrupt Okay. Trust in the Lord with most of your heart and lean not on your own uh, understanding. Baby, baby. Still missed, missed up, missed one. Did you guys notice he missed one word? Okay. All right. Can you guys help me? Trust in the Lord with all, all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all. all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It doesn't matter how insignificant, how little from the insignificant little all the way to the big, everything 
everything God cares about. And when you acknowledge God in every single area of your marriage and whatever God brings to you, he will direct your paths. This, this verse has been so foundational for us in everything. When we had Lindsay and we found out about her special needs and then when we you know, actually with, with the whole birth and delivery and then with our, our parents and then everything we went through with them. I mean, this was super foundational for us. And when both a husband and a wife are both doing this, it's kind of like what happens. Did you ever hear of the marriage triangle? So the marriage triangle is when you invite God into your life and both the husband and wife are, are seeking God with all their heart and acknowledging God in all their ways, what happens is as you go, both grow closer to God, you know what happens to your relationship here? Automatically, you grow closer together. <laughs> Just and illustrating. The reverse is true, too. If, you, if one of you starts saying, I'm going away, I don't want to follow God, and you start going the opposite way, the distance here is going to go greater and greater. So this, this here is a very powerful picture for us, too, because this is how we sur not just survived, how we thrived through the last 30 years. Yeah, so if you want a radically successful marriage, then you need to follow the solid rock of teamwork. And following the solid rock of teamwork means that you're both together following God. It's so important. But the second thing in order to become a radically successful team is uh, to be fully in fully in. And that was one of the things, again, we noticed about the Eagle season, you know, whether it was the coaches, the GM, uh, the staff, uh, the trainers, the players, everybody seemed to be totally committed. I mean, from the start of, of free agency to OTAs or the training camps or the practices to preseason games to the actual season, uh, there was a full commitment to success. And it takes a full commitment of a husband and a full commitment of a wife to have a radically successful marriage and a radically successful team. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, in whatever we do, whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, which includes marriage, by the way, do how much for the glory of God? Some of you know this verse. Well, there's that word all again, right? Do all for the glory of God, meaning that we're trying to magnify God. And one of the ways we can do that is through our marriages when we are fully in. And there's a philosophy among young people today, and it is all over, and we hear this all the time, this whole, that marriage is 50-50. It's 50-50. You give 50, I give 50, that's 100%, right? So I said to, I was talking to a young man about a month ago, and he was saying this, oh yeah, 50-50. I give 50, she gives 50, that's a perfect score, 100. And I said, let me ask you a question. If you give 50% to your spouse, that's 50% of your heart, 50% of your all, 50% of your life to your spouse. What are you doing with that other 50%? What or who is getting that other 50%? You know what 50-50 is? It's divorce. That's where you split everything in half. Marriage is 100-100. 100, 100. 100, 100, giving your all, not splitting everything in half. And so our, our marriage is, is meant to be a reflection of God. And how much did God give to us? Did God give us his best, by the way? He did. He gave us his best. He gave us his only son. Did Jesus give us all? He gave us 100%. I mean, can you imagine Jesus? And, and this is, you can read about this. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, the night before he was to be crucified. And trust me, being the son of God, he knew what was going to happen the next day. But can you imagine Jesus saying, you know, uh, this whole crucifixion thing, it sounds like a lot of pain to me. I don't think so. You, you folks, you're, you're on your own, okay? You need to figure out another way to have your sins forgiven and paid for. Can you imagine if Christ said that? But he didn't, right? He, he didn't put his comfort above our need. He was 100% in, and he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And marriage can be difficult, right? Marriage can be painful. Sometimes we have to take up our cross in our marriages, when it's difficult, when it's painful, and say, you know what? I need to be fully in. I need to be all in because God was all in when I needed it most because Christ was all in when he suffered and said, I love you this much on a cross. And we have an opportunity to go against what our culture says. And our culture says when things get tough, especially in marriage, get out. 
right? And so many times we've had couples come to us and say, you know, we, we, we're thinking about the D word, right? And she or he will say, well, she doesn't make me happy anymore. He doesn't make me happy anymore. And we, will, we always came back to this idea that, you know what, is marriage really meant for our happiness? Is that really the ultimate thing? Yeah, we all want to be happy. Yeah, we all want to find joy. But to place, you know, my satisfaction in life, my, my happiness in life on her, an imperfect person, and, and me, an imperfect husband? No, our joy is to be in the Lord, first and foremost, right? And Gary Thomas, who wrote a book called Sacred Marriage, and we recommend you read that book because it goes way deeper than just the surface stuff of marriage, says, what if, what if, God's intention for marriage wasn't to make us happy. What if it was to make us holy, meaning more like Christ? And I got to tell you, that, that understanding of what marriage is truly about from God's perspective has changed everything for us. I want to make Lisa happy, and I know she wants to make me happy. But more important, God's purpose is for us to make each other more like Christ, more holy. Not that we're ever going to be perfect, because we won't. And I got to tell you, when I first married Lisa, early on in our marriage, well, she was like a mirror to me. I don't think I saw myself clearly. But she helped me to see myself clearly. You know, the, the flaws, the warts, the issues, the selfishness, the pride. Uh, she helped me see that pretty clearly. I didn't always appreciate seeing that, those blemishes. But I needed to, because I needed to deal with those things in my life. I needed to become a better husband, but I needed to become a better man of God. And I'm so thankful Lisa help me do that. And that goes both ways, by the way. <laughs> so follow God, number one. Number two, fully be fully in. And number three, we need to fill gaps. Earlier we read in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for the man to be alone, but I will make her make a helper suitable for him. And that actually that suitable helper actually means like but opposite. So um, it was a perfect match when God created a for, for Adam. But alike, but we're very opposite, right? Wouldn't you agree that men and women are very different, very opposite? Um, and there's a purpose in that. There's a purpose in that. And so what, what Scott lacks, I have, and what I lack, Scott has. And, it, and you fill each other's gaps that way. Um, and so we, Scott's going to illustrate one of the ways we've, we've discovered this. Yeah, the first time I think we ever heard this idea of filling gaps was actually when we were watching our favorite movie, probably for the 20th time. Our favorite Philadelphia movie is what? Is Rocky. Some of you have been to my weddings, you know where I'm going with this. But Rocky Balboa, remember, the boxer, right? Um, his best friend, his name was what? Paulie. And, and he was attracted to Paulie's sister, whose name was? Yo, Adrian, right? And Paulie could not understand, in the middle of the first movie, couldn't understand why Rocky's attracted to his wallflower, you know, not so great looking, backward sister. And so he actually says to Rocky, yo, Rocky, what is it with you and my sister? I don't get it. And Rocky says, well, you know, Paul, I, I really like Adrian. But I got to tell you, Adrian's got gaps, and I got gaps, and together we fill gaps. And I was like, Rocky's a genius. He should be a marriage counselor. Because that is so true of what marriage is supposed to be. And when, when you are working together to fill gaps, not expose them, not complain about them, not grumble about them, not point down a person because you've got this issue. No, we're meant to fill gaps and cover each other in that way. And it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, that two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who has no one to help them up. And part of the reason why Lisa and I not only wore our Eagles jerseys to illustrate teamwork in marriage, but specific jerseys. So who's mine? Carson Wentz. Who's hers? Nick Foles. Okay. Was there something about teamwork with those two this past year? I mean, think about it. Those of you that are Eagles fans, week 13, Carson Wentz goes down with a blown out knee. And all of us said, it's over. Good season, but there's no way we're making it to the Super Bowl, right? But you know what happened next? Nick Foles came into the picture, who had been training. And if you know what was happening behind the scenes, which we did a little bit of reading and research, Carson, even though he was injured and couldn't play, 
was helping folks go through the, the videotapes, go through the playbook, talking about the opponent, helping him be successful because they're both believers. They were praying together, right? That's what I call filling gaps. And Nick came in and did an amazing job, obviously. Became the MVP of the Super Bowl. And who's up on the stage besides next to next to Nick Foles with the MVP trophy? Who was there with the Lombardi trophy? Wentz was up there too. Happy. He was happy for them. They were an amazing team. Amazing team. Amazing illustration of filling gaps. And so we want to move on to the last point. If you want to have a successful winning team in your marriage, not only do you need to follow God, be fully in, not only do you need to fill gaps, but you also need to fight together. That does not mean argue more. It doesn't mean fight with each other, put on the boxing gloves. No, no, no. Fight, comma, or fight, dot, 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 together, meaning that you're in a spiritual battle. Do you believe that? I mean, we just read about it in Genesis chapter 3. The adversary of the devil, like a serpent, attacks the first human relationship. He wants to destroy your marriage. Singles, he wants to destroy your future marriage before it even starts. He hates marriage. And so we're in a spiritual battle. And uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 11, that, that same passage continues by saying, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And our minds tend to think of a husband and wife in bed, you know, keeping each other warm. But that's not the word picture exactly. It goes on to say the very next part. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. We believe that that is a picture of two soldiers sleeping back to back with their guns protecting each other because that is actually an accurate word picture nights were cold back in the middle east and when you were in battle you wanted to make sure you knew if the enemy was coming from one direction or the other so you not only kept each other warm but you had each other's backs you've heard that term i've got your back well that's what this is really saying and in marriage it's so important for us to realize we are in a real battle together against a real enemy Yes, and Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, um, love this verse. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now listen to this next verse. This next verse took our marriage to a deeper level when we realized the, the power behind this verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So we started to pull each other out and bring in, into the light instead of joining when we were, when he, if he was upset, instead of me joining him, I, I did the reverse of, of applying love to bring him out and work together against the real enemy. Yeah, so many of the struggling couples that sometimes we have to meet with in our ministry, um, I mean, it's husband and wife, and they really do look at each other as the enemy. They're taking shots at each other, you know, they're, 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 just struggling with that blame game scenario. And it's so important to get out of that and to realize who the real enemy is. So husbands who are here today, would you repeat after me? She is not my enemy. Very good. That means even when, you know, she, you know, makes faces at you and isn't always respectful sometimes, she is not my enemy. And wives, repeat after me. He is not my enemy. And so if you're here together, go ahead. I was going to say, even when he's not loving, yes. he is not my enemy. So if you're here together with your, your spouse, your partner, would you look at each other and say, you are not my enemy. 
And add this, please. Add this, please. I've got your back. I've got your back. That's the way it's supposed to work. So how do we fight together? Just a couple suggestions. Number one, one of the most important weapons we have is prayer. When I pray for Lisa, when she prays for me, it is one of the most powerful things uh, that, that can happen in a marriage. Because when you pray, you're inviting God into the battle. And you need His power. You need His strength. It says in Ecclesiastes 3 that, you know, a two-stranded cord or rope is strong, but a three-stranded cord braided together is, is unbreakable. And that third strand, by the way, is God that you need to, to make your marriage unbreakable. Does that mean perfect? No. Does it mean no struggles? No. It just means that it's not going to come apart. No matter what comes into your marriage, you have God and you are working together as a team, fighting together as a husband and wife for your marriage. Amazingly powerful. So not only praying together, but growing together. I mean, that's where church and life group and Bible studies uh, and serving together, if you can, will strengthen your marriage in so many ways. And for you singles today, you know, praying uh, for the marriages in your life, but praying for your potential future marriage. And, and let me just say this to you, too. It's so important that you're not just looking for a spouse. You're not just looking for a wife or a husband, but looking for a partner in ministry, a partner in the battle that we face, somebody that will have your back, and somebody that you can love in that way as Christ loves the church. Pray about that as well. So, how do we become a winning team in marriage? Number one, we need to follow God. We need to follow God. Whether you're single or, or, or married, we need to follow God. Uh, follow His ways, His blueprint. We need to be fully in, not 50 50, not 75 75, but 100 100. We need to fill gaps, which means you see a need, you meet a need. You know, if she's weak in one area or her husbands are weak in an area, we fill, we don't complain, we fill the need. And then we fight together. We recognize the battle that we're in and we recognize that we're fighting the right fight against the real enemy. So our desire for you all today, no matter where you're at, singles, divorced, married couples, that God will work in this message to just move your heart closer and closer to His. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that our marriages can truly rock when we have the solid rocks of your word behind us. Thank you for the power of teamwork, God. And uh, we pray that you would help every married couple represented in this room and all the married couples that are a part of our lives, Lord. And we all know couples who are struggling. We all know couples who, who are maybe on that road to divorce, who are holding on by a thread. God, we pray for those marriages, that they would be restored and that they would begin to realize how if they apply your word, your principles that are timeless, God, if they start implementing the solid rocks of marriage, that they can be restored. And God, they can grow into something that will be amazingly beautiful and bring you ultimate glory. So God, thank you for this message today. I pray it make a difference in all of our lives. 